Good evening, Australia. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael Kazilny, and this is Tough Times Never Last. I've been inspired over the years by all the wonderful and down-to-earth guests uh, we've had on the couch, and tonight we've got a top man called Graham Orford. The media have termed him the comeback king, uh, high-profile criminal lawyer who ended up uh, committing a few criminal offences, ended up in jail, and then reinvented his life. Graham, what an amazing story, and uh, we spoke about this many years ago. It's uh, it's been a been a different journey, uh, going from a barrister to a bank robber. And I read your book even before I met you, and it's such a inspirational book. Never give up. What made you write that? I didn't want to write it, and I decided in the end I would because it might do some good. Um, and I gave my royalties from the book to Life Education, so it made it feel like it was a sensible thing to do. What I had no idea was uh, how many people write to you and text you and email you, having read the book and the, the different things they get out of it. I've never ceased to be amazed. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Graham, you've, you've turned out to be such a, and I suppose you always were, such a, a beautiful, caring human being and very authentic. And, and you were always very smart. You, you became a lawyer. What do you think happened along from, from lawyer to prisoner? Alcohol. The grog. Yeah, the grog. I was drinking, uh, I got disbarred in 1979. In the last three or four years, I was drinking 30, 40 beers a day, six days a week. I remember you saying that last time. You're finishing a case of the magistrate's court. You you said they were happy days. You are having... No, I enjoyed everything about and... the drink except what happened. What happened to me was it changed all my morals and ethics. Yeah. And in the end, everything I'd been brought up to believe was right was now wrong, and everything I'd been brought up to believe was wrong was now right. And I developed a criminal practice. I used to act for all the painters and dockers and the guys at freight bases. So I'm drinking with them, and uh, it just escalated. And I think you said last time when I spoke to you, you said uh, there was better money uh, working for the underworld. Yeah, well, it was, uh, it was, they were interesting times. Uh, they'd come in with the cash and uh, in those days in the 70s, there was a lot of bank robberies and uh, I used to act for one of the serious bank robbery teams and I'll never forget there was one particular uh, guy, he's dead now so I can tell the story, he owed me $1,000 <clears> for a bail application. Anyway, he rang me and he said, look, I want you to meet me at such and such address at four o'clock. So I get down there at four o'clock and walk into the kitchen and here's clotheslines across the kitchen with 10 and $20 notes on them and $50 notes. And a dive bomb had gone off in the robbery and he'd been cleaning them with White King. He said, take your $1,000 in any denominations you like. So I'm peeling these notes off at the time, which, you know, when you look back, it's just the stupidest thing you could do, but that's how it was in those days. And you said you used to go to Tassie quite, quite often to the casino there. I yeah, but I, I used to uh, uh, clean money for them because there was a lot. They had a lot of money. Uh, some of the guys I used to act for, and they wanted to clean it. In those days, you'd go down to the casino at, at West Point, and uh, you used to put five hundred on the red, five hundred on the black, hope the O didn't come up. And uh, you'd do that for a couple of hours, and in the end, you'd finish it. You might have started with five grand or 10 grand, and you'd have 10 grand, so you'd take your chips over and they'd give you a check. No, they don't do any of that now. They're too smart for that. But in those days, you could do that. Graham, tell me about your life story. You went to a private school. Yeah, I went to Trinity Grammar. Great uh, school, Q. I remember that. And then you went to um, law school. And um, where did the passion come from for criminal law? Um, I, I did law at Melbourne yeah. and then uh, went to uh, Godfrey Stewart & Co., which was a firm in Burke Street. And I'd been there about five months, six months, uh, doing articles, which mm. you did. And we had a criminal case on for a backyard abortionist, 
we were acting for him. I don't forget his name. It was Alistair Charles Cameron Gardner. And uh, we he paid some money into the account and that ran out three days into the committal. And uh, oh, it must have, must have been after I'd completed my articles in the first year. And Michael said, look, would you finish off the case? I said, yeah, okay. And it was up here at the Melbourne Magistrates Court next door. And so I did that and that was it. I loved it. Uh, How long in the criminal law, Graham? Uh, probably six years, six or seven years. Yeah, amazing. So I went to the bar uh, in 1974. 1974. Spent a couple of years at the bar and then uh, I'd done a, an 05 case at Winchelsea and I was coming back through Geelong and I stopped at the Barwon Hotel for a drink and there were two painters and dockers, I didn't know they were painters and dockers, but the, one of them was Pat Cullen, he's dead now, and Barry, got talking to them and they said, what are you doing? I told them and they said, do you do any deals with the Jacks, the Cobbers? And I said, only if my client wants me to. They said, how much do you charge for a magistrate's court appearance? I said, 500. He said, okay, give me your card. If I send you someone, don't have to worry about getting paid, I'll fix you up. A Couple of weeks later, he rang me and said, I've got a, one of my workers is charged with break and enter in Geelong. I went down and had a bit of luck and won the case. And that catapulted me straight into acting for a number of the guys in the underworld. And we might talk about that underworld family and uh, that county court case uh, when the judge spoke to you. But that's interesting and uh, we'll be back shortly. Uh, Graham Orford on the couch. What a terrific story. The Comeback King. We'll be back very shortly. Thank you very much for watching. Tough times never last. And uh, Graeme Orford's on the couch, the comeback king. I'm very inspired with this man because a lot of people muck up and go off the rails and stay there. But Graeme ended up doing some time at, I think, Pentridge. We'll ask him in a minute. And he was overweight, but apparently he really, really turned his life around and became one of the uh, greatest motivational speakers of all time. And, and Graeme, how long in prison? Can you remember when the judge sentenced you? What did he say? Uh, the first time for the defalcation of the trust account, uh, I got five years jail with a two-year minimum. That's that a pretty big sentence, isn't it? 1979. So I did, in those days they had remissions. You got a third off for good behaviour. Yeah. So I did 16 months. Yeah. Uh, got out, didn't realise I had a problem with alcohol, uh, straight back into it. Then I got sentenced to a couple of months for passing some checks that weren't mine and did that and then got out. And by that stage, I was actually applying for jobs as if I was still a lawyer. And of course I got knocked back and I didn't handle rejection well. So I made a lot of friends in the underworld and met them in jail and uh, they drank like I drank. So I started knocking around with them and then in 1982 on October the 15th, the fateful day, I was arrested uh, robbing a bank in Chapel Street, Paran. With your mates? Yeah, with three other guys, yeah. Did you get much dough? Uh, I got caught at the, almost out the front. I came out of the bank and the police had already arrested that they'd arrived and they were just around the corner, it was fortuitous. So they had the driver, so we ran around the front of the bank in Chapel Street. Uh, Laurie, who's dead now, he hijacked a car and carjacked and took off in the car. Um, John, John Adley, he ran into a shop and pulled his mask off and walked away. And they chased me up Chapel Street and I turned left into Cecil Parade, I remember it. And I was really fortunate, uh, there were a couple of young constables and they actually said, stop us, we'll shoot. And I decided to stop, which I think was a smart move. <laughs> so it was um, out to uh, Pentridge um, and I was on parole at the time. So I got sentenced to seven years jail with a five year minimum, but I had three years broken parole, which meant it was an effectively a 10 year sentence with a five year minimum. And Graham, because you had been there before, did you did you did you go back to some mates? Did you make some? Oh yeah, you, you, yeah. You, I knew most a lot of the guys in the yard because in those days, you were in the remand yard at Pentridge in D Division. So I was down in the remand yards for six months, waiting for the trial to come up. Mm -hmm. Came up in March of '83, mm -hmm. and uh, got the sentence then. Mm. And when you went back to jail, uh, was there any ex clients there? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you like the in-house counsel, weren't you? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, you're in high demand. Um, and there must have been nights when you were thinking, God, all that time at law school and now I'm here. <laughs> what were you thinking where, where the journey was going to end up? It was interesting. I got arrested on the Friday and was kept in the watch house here Friday night and in front of the magistrate's court Saturday morning and remanded, no bail obviously, and then out to Pantridge. 
And that Saturday afternoon, it's Caulfield Cup Day, 1982, I was sitting on the bench next to the water fountain and I was under pressure, the likes of which I've never been before or since. And I kept saying to myself, how did it finish like this? And it was as if I walked out of some form of dream almost. I, I mean, I was looking back at everything that had happened in the previous eight or ten years and, and I just couldn't get my head around it. And I was brought up in uh, mum owned pubs, so I was brought up in an alcohol environment. Mm. I was always brought up to believe the more you drank, the better person you were. So to admit that I had a problem with alcohol was just so foreign to the way I was brought up. And on the Sunday, the 17th at nine o'clock, uh, it came over the loudspeaker in the yards, anyone who wants to attend the AA meeting, uh, come up to the gate. Now, I didn't go to that meeting thinking I had a drinking problem. By that stage, I realised I needed a defence to the bank robbery. I was fairly confident the jury wasn't going to accept that I was just window shopping in Chapel Street, Paran with overalls and gloves and a balaclava. So I, I thought maybe I could use alcohol as a defence. So I went to my first meeting of AA and I heard these three guys who'd come in from outside talk about uh, blackouts and one guy said I used to come home drunk and uh, go to the fridge and get a chicken out and put it in the washing machine and wait for it to cook. And, and I understood that insanity because I can remember coming home blind drunk and thinking the linen press was the toilet and those sort of things. So there was just something about it and there's not a lot to do in prison on a Sunday morning. So I went back the following week and then the following week my life changed. <coughs> Excuse me. A guy came in called Dr Jack and uh, uh, he's still around Jack and he told me his story. And I can remember looking at him and it was just him and I. And I can remember thinking to myself, why would a doctor be coming into Pentridge on a Sunday morning, talking to someone he's never met before, and think that that was going to keep him sober? He said, doctor, he must have a pill or a prescription or something. But I knew one thing coming out of that meeting. He believed that it was doing him the good that he needed to stay off the drink. And uh, so I kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been going for the last 35 years, and uh, haven't had a drink for 35 years, and I feel fantastic. That is fantastic. And you look very fit, and I remember seeing photos <coughs> of you before and after. How, how much did you weigh when, at your heaviest? I blew up to about 135 kilos. Yeah. Um, and so I ripped all that off, and, and I, uh, part of people recovering uh, from alcohol and drugs, I'm a huge believer in physical exercise. Yes. I found it immensely beneficial and uh, so I, I started training and I finished up running a marathon in 1989. Wow, I finished in that half of the race that makes the first half possible. With Frankston in Melbourne? Yeah. Amazing. And, uh, but it finished, so it was four hours and 30 odd minutes of pain and agony, but got there. Terrific. And we might talk about how you lifted, <clears throat> you probably went through a bit of depression, but how you got through that as well, and then how you organised the uh, was it the Russian president? We'll oh, talk the world about that. Of business, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. That's amazing. But uh, we'll be back very shortly. Don't go away. Welcome back to the show. Tough times never last. Love and best wishes. If you're going through some difficult times tonight, remember tomorrow's a new day. Uh, yesterday it was a mystery. To <laughs> what did you say, Hagen Graham? I forgot. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, so focus on today. Focus on today, that's good advice. And particular Today there can be no stress or tension, but if you think about today and yesterday, uh, Graham Orford, the comeback king, high profile lawyer to the uh, to some very, very interesting characters, uh, mucked up, ended up in jail and turned his life around and uh, rebuilt his reputation, rebuilt his health in his mind and then started... Um, achieving some amazing things on the motivational, global motivational stage. Yeah, I got out in 1986, yes. worked as a labourer in a scrap metal yard for a year. Mm -hmm. Then Bob Ants at a budget rent car, gave me a job. Yeah. And then uh, Bob and I set up a business in 1990. Yeah. Bob moved to Queensland to live. Yeah. And I, we'd started to put on some conferences. Yeah. And everyone was getting bigger. And uh, so I brought out Tom Peters. And then I was driving to Broken Hill in 1994. Uh, to put on an event and I thought what if you got the world's highest paid speaker for one day in Melbourne could you make it work 
So I did a couple of spreadsheets and the beauty of spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, if you don't like the figure, you just change them and then suddenly they work. Uh, so we brought out General Schwarzkopf, Norman Norman, Lee Iacocca, former head of Ford and Chrysler, uh, Stephen Covey, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and then we brought out Mikhail Gorbachev, the former head of Russia, uh, President of Russia, and uh, in 2000 we brought out Nelson Mandela and Reuben Hurricane Carter. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And, and Graham is a, a highly effective and complete human being. Not only has he... Uh, studied the law, but he studied people and he studied the bad side and he's seen all these speakers and got tips from the most successful people around the world. And you've done so much. What's next? I, uh, I went back to school a couple of years ago and did my diploma in drug and alcohol counselling. As I said, I haven't had a drink for 35 years. And I've been, I've been doing a lot of counselling over the last seven or eight years. And I'm a real devotee of the 12-step model. Yes. Um, but I wanted to learn more about it. So I went back to school and for a year and did that. And uh, so now I'm, I, I, I do uh, forensic assessments, I do uh, court appearances, I do counselling. That's work, amazing. Work, and you only went back to school because you had to, because you've got to get that silly certificate. But <laughs> I bet you you were so much more qualified in life and experienced than anyone teaching the course. Yeah, well, it, it, it's often an advantage to uh, mm. have been there and done that. Of course. So when you're talking about prisons and what happens in prisons, and I don't think a lot's changed, um, and then you're talking about addiction and where it can lead and whatever and understanding what peop where people are at in the cycle, yeah. uh, it makes – you're able to write, I think, or, or, or work with them on a more factual basis. Yeah. Uh, I've always thought if you – Go up to someone who's got one arm and say, I know how you feel. Yeah. They're going to say, well, how do you know how I feel? You've got two arms and I've got one. So when you're talking to someone who's been there and through it, yeah. both sides, both from an addiction issue and also from a jail point of view, mm. um, I know I would be far more likely to listen to them. Mm. Um, it's an example I always use. I say, if you're going to climb Mount Everest and you've got two options, you can read the book about how to climb Mount Everest or you can actually speak to someone who's climbed the mountain who would you speak to? I know who I'd speak to. I'd speak to someone who's climbed the mountain mm. because they can tell you the little things that you're not going to find in the book. Mm. I'm sure you um, you give them fair income advice and uh, help a lot of people. Graeme, where's this ice epidemic taking us? Where where can you see this see <coughs> heading? Is it um, there was a lot of drugs in the past that faded out, and uh, do, do you think ice will continue being a major problem? Oh yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the problem with ice is it's like 20 times more powerful than speed. Mm. And so it's instant. Um, and like any addictive substance, uh, you need more of it to get the same effect. So once people develop ice habits, and it happens very quickly, uh, the psychosis sets in. And because it's so powerful, you see all these sort of things occurring where, uh, you know, if you talk to ambulance drivers and paramedics, they hate attending scenes where there's ice involved because the people are superhuman, powerful, and they're, they're, all these sort of things are occurring, and it's so prevalent, and uh, it's uh, it's just so destructive. It really is so destructive. We're seeing so many more violent <coughs> offences and family violence because of ice, and I think they're building another two prisons, aren't they? Or yeah, well, that's you know, and, and yeah. of course, the, the law is in a very difficult situation here. On the one hand, you've got to protect the community. Uh, so people have to be locked up to protect the community. Um, and then we try to rehabilitate them. But the programs uh, that they do in jail, I'm not a big fan of for one reason. There's no linkage to when they get out. So if you've got someone who's got an addiction issue with ice or alcohol or opiate-based stuff, heroin or whatever, or even prescription drugs, detoxing them and getting them clean for a period of time is only the start. Mm. So if they're in jail, uh, and let's assume they don't use in prison, so they might have six months or 12 months clean, mm -hmm. but then they're released and they're released back into their old environment. So if they've done a, a, a program or a course in jail, what's the linkage to how they're going to keep going on their path of recovery after they get out. 
And the problem with addiction is you've always got it. Your cards are marked. I, I'm, I've got the same problem now, 35 years since I've had a drink, and that is I'm an alcoholic. And I know if I pick up a drink, I'll mm. be back drinking the way I was very quickly because that's the proven fact of addiction. So I need a form of maintenance in my life, which mm. I've got. Mm -hmm. Same thing for people coming out of prison. They need a connection, and the, by far the best connection is the 12-step model of NA, Narcotics Anonymous, mm -hmm. and, and AA. The problem with counselling with psychologists and those sort of things, it can work for a while, but it's not long-term mm. for an addict. For an abuser of alcohol or an abuser of drugs, they can curtail and harm minimisation and bring them back, and they can probably use in safety to some extent. But for the addict, there is no safety. It's either abstinence or nothing. And getting someone's head around that's very difficult early on mm. because, what, never going to drink forever. Mm. Uh, that's a frightening concept for a lot mm. of people. And, <clears> Graham, <throat> what would you say to people? Because there's a whole bunch of people waiting for trials and might be good people who got drunk and killed somebody culpable driving and they're awaiting a term of imprisonment and they just feel like killing themselves because there's all this fear about jail and maybe missing out on a decade of their lives. And I, I, I know a few people who are sort of uh, looking at that um, prospect. How, how do they mentally prepare themselves for prison? I've, over the last 25 years, I, I, I would have spoken to probably 30 or 40 people who are going to jail and have been referred to me by friends or whatever. And I say to them, <clears throat> first of all, there's a couple of rules about jail. Mind your own business. Don't shoot it off your mouth. If there's a line, get at the back. Don't get at the front. And fit in, don't stand out. Also, use every minute of every day on a self-improvement. I look back at the four and a half years, the last sentence I did, <coughs> excuse me, and I utilised almost every day to, to improve myself, to get tougher mentally, to uh, learn how to handle rejection, to get prepared. Because my first two jail sentences, I didn't. I just got out and fell straight back into the same environment. And I can remember when I was at the bar, I read with a guy called John Hanlon, who became a county court judge. And John wrote to me about 1985, about a year before I got out. And he said, Graham, I've heard you're doing some good things with your life. Congratulations. Whatever you're doing in there, the day you get out, is the day you're gonna to have to redouble your efforts. And I've never forgotten that. <clears throat> so most people, the first thing they think about when they're getting out is uh, party, celebrate getting out. Nothing's happened, you've been in training for three years or four years. The day you get out's the day the game starts. And if you've done the right preparation and you've made the right decisions and how you're gonna go about it, then you stand a chance of not falling back. But we all know the recidivism rate in the first six months of release is horrendous. It certainly is, Graham. And uh, mate, such inspirational words. Can we have you on again in a couple of months? Yeah, and, love um, to. That'll be terrific. Thank you so much. You're a great inspiration. And thank you very much for watching. Graham Orford, love and best wishes. We'll see you next week. Good night.